Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and today I have a very special guest, someone who I've admired for many, many years, uh, wrote the first Spider-Man comic I ever read, and he's also worked on these, uh, you know, the new Spider-Man cartoon, which is what we're here to talk about today, but before we get to that, I want to give people a chance uh, to get to know him a little bit more, and that is J.M. Diamateus. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Happy to be here. All right, and, uh, and J.M. has... An amazing body of work. I'm sure a lot of you out there who listen to the show know who he is. We've mentioned him on the show a dozen times before. Uh, but for those who aren't new listeners, uh, you know, if you're new to him, his work it's you know ranges from everything from comics to you know to writing movie uh, or to writing to music. You know, uh, talking about music and reviewing uh, old you know albums and things like that and, and different records. And uh, and he now does animated movies and he works in a lot of different fields. He's covered a lot of genres in uh, in his career and it's it's a big pleasure to have you here, sir. So thank you again for being here you're very welcome awesome so yes we're going to talk about marvel spider-man obviously we have maximum venom but there's also an episode you wrote before called bring on the bad guys uh that was part of this show as well and we'll get to those here yeah, in a second there were actually there were actually two episodes i wrote before yeah, yeah oh yeah. yeah yeah that's right um so i will talk about those here in a second we'll mention those but sure. i do want to go back uh, because i'm a big fan of music and i love as i was you know uh, looking more into you and into your work and stuff i was so enthralled and, and happy to see that you have a background in music as well and so i kind of i guess i want to start there and say you know one obviously i'm a big fan of music but with a uh, with you having a background in singing songwriting and rhythm guitar what are some musicians that have kind of inspired you over the years and which musicians did you aspire to be like when you uh, yourself were in a band you know um it's it's going to be a cliche but there's no there's no band that means more to me than the beatles okay uh there's there's no artist with the beatles or solo whose work means more to me than john lennon uh so that's probably the biggest influence you know to be influenced by the beatles is to be influenced by every genre of music you know because you know listen to the white album and hear every kind every kind of style and genre that they hit on this one album and so growing up listening to that music opened my mind to so many kinds of music. So that's probably the primary influence. And Lennon's solo music just means more to me in some ways than even the Beatles music does. Um, I also, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, as a kid grew up in a house with parents that loved Frank Sinatra, so I grew up with a Sinatra soundtrack in my life too. <laughs> and and I still love Sinatra, but, but I was thinking about this. The thing that was really so great about the radio, when I, I was a kid in the 60s and a teenager in the 70s, so this dates me, um, but the radio in the 60s was everything. You know, now everything is in a little niche. Then you'd turn on the radio and you would hear the Beatles. You'd hear Frank Sinatra. You'd hear uh, the Supremes and Marvin Gaye. You would hear Dean Martin. You'd hear Bob Dylan. You know, every kind of music was coming over. So it was, a, you know, all that stuff saturates your consciousness to be exposed to all those genres and all those styles, you know. And, and, and then, you know, over the years, so many other great artists that I've loved, from Bowie to Springsteen to more recent acts like more recent, you know, 20 years ago, Radiohead, Oasis, <laughs> you know, Postal Service, Death Cab for Cutie, whatever. Um, but, but the fundamentals to me, it all goes back to the Beatles. That's, uh, that's amazing. And, uh, and so when you were playing music and stuff, was obviously all those guys and all that music had an influence on you, but did you ever try to yeah. recapture any of that sound or did you, you know, try to just use that as a, a springboard to create your own sound? It's, you know what, it influenced me in the sense of, of really, I kind of learned how to write songs by listening to that stuff. You know, my idea of what a great song, of a model for a great song, where the verse and the chorus and the melody and all these things and strong lyrics, you know, and a great hook and a nice guitar solo, it all comes from listening to that stuff. Um, so so not so much wanting to 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 ape that music, but but you know, it comes out if you've listened to any of my music, if you hear any of my music, you'll hear that in there. But hopefully what you do as same thing with writing. You absorb your influences, but you want to then channel that through you and get your own voice to come through. Well, it may be clear what the influences are, but you want to sort of transcend might be the wrong word, but sort of bring those influences together and then find your own voice to express those influences through and your own point of view. Um, where where the even bigger influence in some ways is uh, is is production. My ideas of what great production is really comes still goes back to the Beatles and what a great Beatle album sounds like, you know. And um, I did a I, I, I did a little independent CD back in the '90s called How Many Lifetimes, which you can find on Spotify and Apple Music and other places. And I've actually been spending these, this period in lockdown uh, making demos of a whole bunch of songs because I'm getting the urge to go back into the studio again. And so I'm sitting playing the guitar, playing the piano, 
but in my head I hear the whole arrangement, you know, and I'm hearing like, you know, Abbey Road in my head <laughs> right, you know, right. while it's just me banging up the piano alone. <laughs> so those influences really echo not just in the structure and the songwriting, but in, in, in production as well, in my view of what a good record sounds like. That's amazing. I mean, that's one thing I take note of, too, is uh, the, the creation of things. And, and when I see that level of care and passion and hard work go into it, um, it helps me recognize that more. So that's that's so great for to hear that. Um, and it makes sense because I feel like when I read your writing, I also see that. Like uh, there are some writers that just get me to look past just their words and I kind of see the the the, um, the blueprints behind it and uh, it's uh-huh. it's kind of neat and it does it, it you're right it's very uplifting and inspiring and it does make you like you said not want to ape it but kind of find a way to channel it through you and and, and bring it out in a new way which is I, I love that man it's, it's it's clear you have a, a deep passion and everyone out there please yes go check out his music on Spotify for sure and I'll put a link down in the description box for a link for that so you're one click away to check it out Oh, that's great. And, you know, and it's the same, like I said, it's the same with writing. It's the same thing. You know, I look at early work and I can see myself struggling with all my influences and trying to find my voice in that. And it really wasn't until I did a project called Moonshadow, which I'll plug. It just came out in a new edition (laughs) from Dark Horse uh, last year. We just got nominated for an Eisner for it. Um, But that's where I was able to step out of the Marvel and DC universes and just write like me. All my influences are still there. You can see all my influences and yet... It was me for the first time, really me writing as me. And that's the that's the journey, is for, I think, for any creative person. You know, even if you're an actor. I remember hearing an interview with Jason Alexander from Seinfeld, and he said he spent the first part of his career either imitating William Shatner or Woody Allen, which is a really interesting combination, <laughs> you know, before he kind of, I think, found who Jason Alexander was as an actor. So we all do that to some degree. And um, the, the trick is always to, to then find what you have to say you know find who you are and what is unique to you that you can express while paying tribute and honoring all the influences that brought you there yeah and and i agree and actually i'm glad you brought up moonshadow because yeah for everyone out there and again i'll have links down below um not only does he have moonshadow the definitive edition that's out for dark horse right now but also impossible ink which is being released by idw and it's out now you have the girl in the bay uh, and then obviously the superman the red sun animated film which I loved, by the way, I went to the premiere of it in, in Los Angeles before I moved to Florida. Oh, you did? Yeah, right before I moved to Florida, it was the last thing I did in L.A. and uh, with my roommate, who is an actor, and uh, we had the time of our lives. It was an amazing movie. And You got to go to the premiere. You know, We were all set to go to the New York premiere, and that was the first sign I got that this COVID thing was going to be a little stranger than we thought because that was the first thing that in my life that was canceled because right. of this. Right. We you did know, the we yeah we did the L A one and then I heard like the very next day or or the day before it was they're like this is it because we're canceling the New York one I was like oh man. yeah yeah I was so disappointed so disappointed but I totally understand but I was still disappointed I understand well let me tell you the the audience and where I was with we I mean everyone freaked out we loved it it was a, a great adaptation of that comic and also brought a lot of new things to it but really you really nailed the voice of those characters man you did a great job oh thank you uh, it helps when you know you're working with people like uh producers like bruce tim and jim Creek, sure. who are such great not just great producers but great writers in their own right so you know it's really when you when you start when you're working in film and tv it's very much a collaborative uh effort so yeah. i have to give credit to those guys as well and then the director sam Liu, who did such a beautiful job of that yes yeah, sam luckily i've had a, a, the opportunity to interview him and jim Creek before oh, you did oh, oh that's great and they're both amazing guys sam's a friend and uh jim is too and they're, they're fantastic guys and you're right and actually to quote the the late joel schumacher who just passed away um who i was a big big fan of uh, he taught me something, although not directly, but via an interview that he did. But he talked about collaboration, and he said, "When you make a movie and it's great, it's it's because of the efforts of everyone that worked on the movie." And he says, "When you make a movie and it's bad, it's just the director's fault." And I, I think that was his way of uh, just just being cute, but also you know uh, be, you know taking a. I guess accountability, people have feedback on a lot of his films, but me, I love his stuff. I thought he was a talented guy, and that's, that quote always stuck with me, and it helped me get better at collaboration myself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and it definitely, it's definitely uh, a very, very collaborative medium, and that's fun for me, because I spend most of my time, as I often say, alone in a room with my imaginary friends, and in <laughs> comics, even when it's a collaboration, it's just between maybe two people with an editor looking over your shoulder, you know? So the right. story is generally my story. The vision is my vision. When I'm working in TV or film, um, I have to take that 
that my hat off, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And sure. put on my collaborator hat. But that's fun for me because I always say, what, what could be better than being on the phone with Jim Creek and Bruce Tim for two hours talking about story? Uh, I, you know? I, yeah, I can't think of anything better than that. <laughs> At least if you're a storyteller, that's the best thing you could possibly sure. be doing with your time. You yeah, know? <laughs> absolutely. Um, and speaking of that, too, I'll give a quick plug. You do have another animated movie coming up called Deathstroke yes. Knights and Dragons. And so, yeah, if you're a Deathstroke fan out there, guys, you got to check this out. The trailer just dropped. I'll put a link to that down below, too. It is awesome. It looks great. I can't wait to watch it. Yeah, I'm really happy with the way that one turned out as well, and I can't wait for everyone to see it. There's been a kind of a, a shortened version of the first half has been on CWC for a while, but this is the full movie. Okay. Uh, and with lots of extra stuff in it, you know, and it's, it really, really turned out well. I'm very happy with it. Uh, I can't wait. And uh, so speaking of like, so you, we mentioned some DC things here. So some of your early work, uh, you know, was writing for various music publications. And I'm kind of curious, how did you go from that world with, with music and, and kind of covering and reviewing music to uh, pitching things over at DC Comics? You know, I, I, I always had, my brain, I guess, was on was on two different tracks. I had the music track in my brain, and I had the writing track in my brain. Actually, when I was a kid, my first passion was drawing. Uh, that's what I loved more than anything. Then it sort of evolved into drawing, uh, into writing and music. And so, even though I was playing in bands um, and writing music, um, I was also always trying to break in as a writer. I, you know, the band would be playing at night and I'd spend the, the days you know, writing short stories and sending them out to magazines back in the days when you could send short stories to magazines <laughs> and getting, you know, getting rejected but writing, then going off and writing the next story which is a great way to flex those muscles you know? uh, rejection can be instructive sometimes um, and basically and I always loved comics I always loved comics so I always knew that I wanted to, um, to do that as well and a lot of things kind of came together at the same time you know my, my band broke up at a certain point and and I around the same time I transitioned into music journalism so it's a great way to kind of fuse my love of writing with my love of music um, and a great way to get free albums and go see free concerts that was always the best part <laughs> and um, and and I was making my first inroads you know kind of knocking my head against the wall of comics and what happened was at a certain point when I was writing reviews, I, I had managed to, to kind of get in the door at Rolling Stone and I started writing some reviews for them. I was just like, I was like the baby steps at Rolling Stone. I was like the bottom of the barrel. I wasn't some big writer there. I don't want to create the wrong impression. <laughs> and so I'd done a few reviews for them and I, and I did a review of this Grateful Dead album, which I still remember called Go to Heaven. And somewhere on the internet, it's out there, I know. And um, I, I was a little smug in my review. Uh, I have to say, you know, I was a little snarky. And and those of you that know the Grateful Dead know that Grateful Dead fans may be even more fanatical than comic book fans. <laughs> right. So um, so I got this, one day I get this, uh, this envelope from Rolling Stone, and it's a stack of mail from Grateful Dead fans. And it's not so much that they were angry, it's that they were wounded and confused, you know? It was like, it was as if I had written something about their mothers, you know? Why would you say this? Don't you? And it was like it really, it really knocked me back. And I went, you know what? I really don't want to be the guy critiquing people's art. I want to be the guy making the art and being critiqued. Right. And I've had my fair share over the years, I have to say. <laughs> and so I really just dropped it. I dropped the whole reviewing thing and walked away from it. Um, I often wonder if I had continued on that path, where would that have led? What what other parallel universe would I ended up have ended up in? But uh, and that was right around the time when I started to break in at, at DC, and so it all worked out. Awesome, and uh, yeah, and I love some of your early DC stuff, especially the the weird war tales and uh, a lot of the characters you created over there. I mean, you've done some great stuff, and I'll get to that here in a second. But I I do want to you know I'm going to open up here for for a moment if you don't mind and say that sure you know when. When I, because when I think of your work and kind of how I was introduced, like I grew up watching the uh, Spider Man is Amazing Friends show, um, and mm -hmm. and you know I was a Transformer fan. I'm a kid of the '80s, so I liked all that stuff. And then when I when I got into comic books, you know I was about seven years old. Um, you know, unfortunately, I didn't grow up in a, a great home. And at the beginning, I had a, a really uh, you know rough a childhood as far as with my father goes, and wow. I suffered a head injury and I was put in the hospital. And that's when my mom. Oh wow. My uh, yeah, but, but you know. But my mom, she was awesome. She she protected me from you know from further damage. Obviously, I got to the hospital, and while I was there, she was like, you know, what do I do? He's going to be here for a while. So someone recommended comic books, and she's like, oh, why didn't I think of that? I know kids love comics, 
So she went out and got me some comics. So of course, like I said, I grew up on Spider-Man's Amazing Friends. She tells the guy, hey, my son wants, you know, I'd just give me a stack of whatever you recommend, but make sure there's some Spider-Man in there. And of course, what's in there was uh, some Spider-Man Fearful Symmetry issues, uh, which is a, a very big departure from uh, from Spider-Man. Yeah, Zach. to say the least. Holy moly. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if the guy at the store that my mom went to... Uh, knew I was a child. I don't know if my mom said that to him. She just said, oh my... So you were like seven years old? <laughs> yeah, I was seven. And this is 1987, okay. Yeah, and I, so I'm reading, um, I'm reading, you know, Craven's Last Hunt, and uh, <laughs> which that's what it's called now. <laughs> and it, you know, obviously it ends with this intense ending. And my mom was like, you know, you're never going to read Spider-Man again. <laughs> and I was like, no, please don't. You know, so, uh, but th to me, those moments are, are precious to me. You know, I'm glad I still have those memories and I'm glad my mom does too. So, um, you know, with that, having said that and shared this story with you, I, I imagine because that is such a iconic Spider-Man story, um, how many people come to you and say that whether they call it Fearful Symmetry or Craven's Last Hunt, that that was their first Spider-Man story or their favorite Spider-Man story, and how did kind of that story come to life? Well, first I want to ask you, you were seven years old, did that story completely freak you out? See, it, 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 I, I don't know what my reaction was to it, I just know my mom's reaction. So my, Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, so my mom, I remember she... Because I guess I brought it to her, and I was—I had questions like, "What happened here?" And she was like, "Oh my god!" And she was like, "What kind of Spider-Man book is this?" So, uh, so yeah, I mean, of course, of course she. So, but but she, you know, she loves telling that story, and of course she, you know, I, I'm a huge Spider-Man fan now. I mean, I do a whole show about Venom, and we talk about Spider-Man often. So, it, it in a lot of ways it shaped me. It shaped me as a, a writer myself and a storyteller, and and just as a fan, it inspired me. But. Um, yeah, no, I don't really remember my reaction other than just being confused, but I re definitely remember her reaction to it. That's so interesting. That's so <laughs> interesting. Anyway, as, as to what you were saying, um, I'd say when I go to conventions, mm -hmm. a third of what I sign is Craven's Last Time. Okay. And that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Because you know, I've been doing this for like 40 years, so there's a lot of material out there. <laughs> yes. So that a third of that is Craven's Last Hunt is pretty staggering. And, you know, in, in those days, you know, collected editions and all that stuff was still, still pretty new. It was a big deal when they collected Craven in the 80s and put it in a hardcover and, you know, got Stan to write the introduction and all that stuff. That was not common. Like now, you know, you sneeze and they put out a collected edition, basically. <laughs> but back then, it was, so, you know, people, I certainly wasn't thinking about, wow, this is a story we'll be talking about in 30 years or anything like that. You know, it was, you know, you finish that story, you're on to the next one. Right. So that, that, that this story has, has lived on and that people come up to me, you know, who read it when they, just like you, who read it when they were kids. And I always, I always wonder if I'm going to get the psychiatrist bill or, or, <laughs> or the people that, that read it last week for the first time, you know, so it's, and that's what you hope for, for any piece of work, that it has that kind of life that people are, discovering and rediscovering that story not you know not just over the months after it comes out but over decades after that so it's pretty amazing and and i can i'm sure i speak for mike mike zek uh yes. and bob mcleod when i say we're incredibly grateful that this story has had the life it's had i'm glad yeah those two gentlemen's um, art is just a fantastic and and uh oh man that story is i'll tell you how much that story inspired me was I worked at Sony when Spider-Man 3 came out in 2007 in Los Angeles, uh -huh. and uh -huh. the writer strike was vastly approaching, and at Sony at the time, they were really looking for trying to, to greenlight a script for a Spider-Man 4 as fast as they could. And so me and some friends that worked at Sony, we all wrote a, a Spider-Man 4 script, and we actually, you know turned it in of course or we registered with the writers guild but of course since we weren't known names it just kind of got put on a shelf somewhere but our story was uh, an adaptation of craven's last hunt um, ah. because it, it was we were like we craven's gotta be in the next movie he's like and, and we had the scene where he get you know spider-man gets buried and we we tied the lizard into it and everything and we had a great time but that's so there are things that that story probably affected in people's lives that you guys will you know not know about like th you know stuff like that yeah, yeah, uh, and, and hopefully we'll, we will see a, a, a Craven movie one of these days. I don't think we're going to see it with the current Spider-Man until he's significantly older. But uh, sure. you know, I, I've said since we're talking about animation on the show that I think uh, you know the, the way that DC does these wonderful standalone animated films. Uh, I think that's what Marvel should do with Craven. I think it would be a great, great animated movie. 
Uh, and um, agree. And you also jump right over the the problem of having your lead actor who you're paying twenty five million dollars buried alive for a third of the story. <laughs> <laughs> In animation, it's not that big a deal, you know. Right. You know, I get it. Uh, that's true. Um, I, yeah, you're right. That would be a great, like, cool PG-13 animated Marvel movie. That yeah. And Although I have to say, someone recently said to me, I thought this was a brilliant idea. Um, if they would get Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire and Kirsten Dunst back, because you need an you need an adult Spider-Man for Craven's last time, sure. and let let them do a stand just the way the Joker was a standalone movie. Let them do a standalone Craven's last time with that old t- the Sam Raimi team. Oh. I think that would be phenomenal. Oh, that would be. That's definitely uh, fans everywhere are just freaking out right now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a brilliant idea. I it really is. Did. It is yeah. a very good idea. Yeah, you just call it Craven, just like Joker. Um, yeah, yeah. The so um, with speaking of your your amazing resume, you've done stuff that you know. I like I said, I grew up reading Justice League International. I love your Martian Manhunter mini series you did with DC, and obviously. Oh, we, thank you. I, 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 that's what I'm really fond of as well. Yeah, that's that made that's why John Jones is in my top three DC characters of all time, um, and Weird World Tales, like I said. Uh, but you also have done Spider Man, you know, Prince Namor, Defenders. You've done a lot of great stuff at Marvel, DC, at a lot of places. Like you know, we mentioned IDW and Dark Horse earlier. So and tons of stuff for Vertigo and yeah, yes, yes, many oh, different yeah. things over the years. Yeah. Oh yeah, and so when did you make the leap from writing comics to jumping into the animated world? Um, you know, I, I had I had dabbled in animation. The mm-hmm. first animated thing I ever wrote actually was back in the 80s, if, if you remember the real Ghostbusters cartoon. I do. Um, and the, the story editor on the real Ghostbusters was a, an obscure guy named J. Michael Straczynski, um, <laughs> who yeah. has since vanished and no one has ever heard of him since. Yes. Um, but I just happened to get plugged into that. I, I was plugged into that show because I think Mark Wolfman had done something for them. And I was in L.A. and I ended up meeting Straczynski and I ended up selling them a script. But I had, I had no passion for writing animation. I wasn't really all that interested. It was fun to write it. And then in the 90s, I, 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 I co-wrote an episode of the 90s Spider-Man cartoon. But again, it wasn't anything that was pulling me, calling me. I was, I was really more focused. I'd done some live action TV in the 80s and 90s, and I was more focused on that. And then what happened was, um, Sometimes you, you, you stumble backwards into the best gigs of your career, you know? Mm-hmm. It's not part of the plan. And I always say that to people. I do a writing workshop, uh, uh, which I'm hoping to bring online in the fall. Um, and it's sometimes it's the very thing that you don't expect that, that opens some incredible door. You know, you, you think you're walking straight ahead and you walk into a wall, so you have to go right. And you go right and there's a door and you walk through it and it opens up a whole new world for you. And that's kind of what happened with animation. I'd worked on the live action Superboy show, if anyone even remembers it. I do. Uh, which was from the late 80s, early 90s. Mm-hmm. I worked on the last season. I wrote about five episodes of that worked on staff for a short period of time and the producer of that show was a great guy and a great writer named Stan Berkowitz oh, yeah. and and Marty Pasco who recently passed away was working on the, the the 90s Spider-Man show and I had talked to Marty about possibly doing something for the show and Superboy had just ended and I said you know you should really meet my friend Stan Berkowitz he's a great writer and I bet you he'd love to do something for you so Stan started working on the Superboy show and that for him opened up this whole door to an Emmy-winning career in the animation field. He, you know, he worked on Superman, the animated series, and Justice League Unlimited, and so many other shows. You know, great, great guy, great writer. So then, so Stan is working on Justice League Unlimited. This is probably about 2004, and calls me up one day and says, do you want to do one for us? And I was like, I'll, you know, I'll always try something. I'll always say yes. <laughs> and uh, the first thing they handed me was uh, for the man who has everything, yeah. the Alan Moore story. Right. <laughs> which I always say, thank God I, I hadn't read. So I wasn't I wasn't intimidated by the legend of this incredible mythic tale that everyone considers one of the great stories of all time, or I might have gone and hit under my desk for a week before I started writing, you know? Right. But I, I worked on that one, and that went well, and they liked what I did, and they kept giving me work. And I discovered just how much fun working in animation was, and especially to work on a show like Justice League Unlimited, which was, you know, that's one of the best iterations of the Justice League ever. You, you bring bring me any other version of the Justice League, and Justice League Unlimited is right up there with the very, very best and better than most. You know, those guys understood those characters, they understood that world, and they got so much story and character and humor and humanity into a half-hour episode. You know, so I learned a lot uh, writing on that show, and I learned 
uh, to really respect the animation uh, writer's craft by working on that show. And that's what really opened the door. And, uh, you know, I, I went from that and on and on to a lot of different shows and these animated movies. So it's been, I don't know, 16 years or whatever it is. And it, 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 it turned into a whole other channel of my career, which I'm incredibly grateful for, both uh, creatively and financially. So it, it was, it, but it was accidental. It was sort of like, okay, Stan, all right, well, sure, you know, and off we went. That's amazing. Yeah, actually, we covered um, your episode for The Man Who Has Everything because uh, on Patreon, I did a Superman podcast for a while, and I oh, went okay. I went through the entire history of Superman, and uh, and then we got to the animated stuff, and I was like, well, we got to talk about this adaptation of the, for The Man Who Has Everything because it's written by one of my favorite comic writers, and he's adapting one of the best Superman stories of all time. So, uh, so that's great. I mean, yeah, and, and seeing your career go like it's so great every time i see your name because there'll be sometimes like i said i try to follow what you're working on but there'll be times where i'm like all right let's you know i want to rent this movie because like i said i i i know sam and i like sam lou and and the guys over jim krieg and the guys at, and gary and everyone at warner Brothers animation and so oh gary's great yeah yeah and so whenever i see them promote something i'm like oh yeah I'll check it out or oh wow that came out i forgot and i'll watch it if i see your name in the credits i just go okay and then like i put i turn off my phone i'm just like okay i'm i'm locked in now i'm so i'm so into this so um with your with those being like your you like you said your career and something you fell into the past couple years and you fell in love with now your latest stuff that you've been working on is kind of the reason you're here today which i you know i appreciate uh kevin burke and doc wyatt for you know putting us in touch with each other because um you know i like i said i cover everything venom this show you're on like the 520 something episode of my show um i i've done venom for like almost three years now and i love the character to death and what you're doing with marvel's maximum uh, you know maximum venom you wrote uh, half of the the third episode which is called vengeance of venom like i said you also did an episode in one of the earlier seasons you did uh, uh it was called bring on the bad guys so how did you get involved and then there was one in the middle the title of which completely escapes me yeah i'm so sorry <laughs> We'll, we'll have to go to IMDb and look it up. Uh, <laughs> but um, how did I get involved with the show? Yeah, how did you get involved the with the yeah the first season and then and then also coming back to it this season? Um, I uh, I knew Steve Wacker, who was a wonderful editor both at DC and Marvel, and I had done all this work uh, uh, on deep for DC animation, but I I um, had never done any Marvel animation, and you know this. There's, they've been doing a lot of stuff, so I, I don't remember whether we were talking face to face or whether whether we um, we were just emailing. And I just said, "Oh, I'd love to do something uh, for one of the Marvel shows." Uh, I looked up the the other one was called "The Road to Goblin War." That's that was it. The one. Yep, I was just about That's to t- say that too. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, we both we both have our computers in front of us, clearly. And so Steve, you know, Steve just plugged me into the, you know into the show, and and I got a call. Uh, from either Kevin or Doc one day, and, and uh, turned out happily that they were fans of my work and knew my work, so that was that's always helpful. And we just started working, and I wrote the first episode. They liked that. They gave me another. They liked that, and they gave me another. It just goes like that, you know. Sure. Hopefully, you hit it off creatively. And I really, really like and respect both those guys. Uh, it's you, you always want to work with people who are talented and are also really nice people. Right. And 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 those guys fit the bill. You know, they really fit the bill. So so that's that's how it happened. And uh, yeah, that's how I got in on that one. That's great. And Steve Wacker, I've uh, I've only had a couple interactions with him, but always the nicest guy in the world. Um, actually, I used to work at yes. a place in L.A. called Golden Apple Comics. And, yeah, oh, I know it. Sure. Yeah, and I um one day someone came in and tried to steal copies of Spider Man, and I chased the guy out and got the copies back. <laughs> And, uh, and that guy was Steve Wacker. And that guy was Steve Wacker. That's how we met. Uh, no, actually, Steve Steve Wacker emailed me to say thanks for for uh, for saving Spidey books. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. yes, Steve is a good guy and a very talented guy as well. Very awesome. So, you know, now that we're talking about this season, uh, you know, in the episode you wrote for the Maximum Venom show is obviously revolves around a new iteration of Mark Spector, aka the Moon Knight. Can you talk a, can you talk a bit about writing this version of Mark and what elements uh, did you uh, you know or other you know people that were involved in the show bring in that uh, br- you know brought this version of Moon Knight to life? Sure. So as I said earlier, these things are really collaborative right. efforts, and especially when you're writing for episodic TV um, on a show like Spider Man, where they've got a whole arc worked out, right? They know they have a whole season of this Maximum Venom thing going on, mm-hmm. um, so they have all the episodes. The basics they've got the structure of that thing 
the, you know, the scaffolding of that building was all set. So they come to me and they say, this is what we're doing in this episode. Here's this beat, this beat, this beat, this beat, this beat. So, so it's not the case where I'm coming in and pitching and saying, why don't we do Moon Knight and here's my great idea for Moon Knight. Sure. On, some shows you, on some shows you get that opportunity because it's a little bit looser and the structure is loose enough for you to do that. Uh, in this, they had very specific things they wanted to hit in that episode. And what I liked about uh, what they had set up was that there was really room for real emotion in this story. I love the idea of Moon Knight as this guy who really lost faith and hope, you know? And in the course of the story, if we're not giving too much away, finds that faith and hope again, and he finds it by, through, through even, finds it through Spider-Man, but he finds it in some ways even more through Aunt May, right? Okay. It's, uh, and, and it inspires him to literally come up uh, from the hole he's been hiding in. And it, it, it's, it's, it was a great, dramatic, emotional story. And those are the kind of stories I love, so, I will do a good job for you if you give me a story with that level of psychology and emotion in it. So I had a lot of fun with that. And 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 that was the thing that I latched onto more than anything. You know, the action is always great. It's always great to write the action. But if there's not some really wonderful character stuff going on there, if there's not a nice emotional or psychological journey happening, then it's a bunch of people punching each other and who cares, you know? <laughs> you care because you care about the people. And then you have the fun of, of the punching and the hitting and dropping buildings on each other's heads. You know? Exactly. Yeah, that's like the added, added to it. But it's, uh, you know, I feel the same way. I mean, the stuff with, and, and here, and by the way, for anyone listening still at this point, obviously we're going to talk about probably some mild spoilers for the episode. It did air this past weekend. Make sure you go check it out. You can watch it on the Disney, Owl, uh, Disney Now app. Uh, that's free. You can download on your phone and you can watch episodes one, two, and three there. Um, or you can watch them on Hulu as well. And uh, and the, the, they replay the episodes uh, every time a new episode comes out. So uh, we will talk about minor spoilers here. So we have... The Aunt May thing you mentioned, I gotta say, like I, I'm, I love that character. Uh, you know, I grew up with a, a single mom after my parents got divorced, so I, I kind of always liked that relationship between Aunt May and Peter. It, it reminded me a lot of my relationship with my mom, and so when when writers do really neat things with her, I it, it means a, a lot to someone like me who who feels like that character sometimes gets a great attention and sometimes is just like there in the background. And what I loved about this episode was she was very essential into um, helping, you know, water the seed that Peter had kind of already planted in Mark Spector's mind as, as far as repeating Uncle Ben's right. words, you know, it was like, uh, he, he repeats, right. says, you know, he's like, hey, Uncle Ben said, with great power comes with great responsibility. Don't call my uncle, uncle stupid. He, he meant a lot to me. And then when right. May, May repeats those, then now it's that seed is a tree and it, it changes uh, Mark. So in crafting arcs like that for for this episode you know like you said they, they already have kind of some of the beats out there but when you come in and, and try to forge that stuff uh, what were to you the most important elements to maintain while telling a story like that and what elements did you maybe add to kind of you know help that grow you know what happens there's there's such a mind mill that happens that i couldn't tell you where they left off and i began <laughs> sure yeah you know and it's, it's a fascinating process because especially in situations where you're handed the structure of a story. So I have two jobs, and they're contradictory. My job is to give them exactly what they're looking for, right. and also to bring as much of myself and my own personality and my own personal point of view to the story and the characters, you know, right. and fuse those two things together. So I couldn't tell you, what did I, because I don't remember, I, this, you know, this, they, come on, they come on TV sometimes, you know, a year after you've written a thing. Right. So I don't remember exactly where they left off and I began. I just know uh, kind of what I said a moment ago was that it really the thing I hooked onto the most was the characters, the characterizations, the emotion, uh, especially uh, Moon Knight's journey. I really, really connected with that. So what I hope I did was really bring that out because, you know, a skeletal outline is one thing, but you have to bring that out in a way uh, to communicate that to the audience and through the actors and all that. And, you know, it's always all these wonderful voice actors doing this. Mm -hmm. So I hope that what I did was take the, the seeds of that emotional journey that were there and what they gave me and and forgive the clumsy metaphor let those seeds really grow right. into a big giant tree you know right. um, but that that's because that's what I focus on most of all uh, along with you know delivering everything else that they ask for yeah and, you know sometimes and not necessarily in this situation but I've had things where you know you get the you get the notes on what they want the story to be and you sit down to write it and you realize that things aren't connecting up and things aren't making sense, and then you have to take a deep breath and change it and hope that they're okay with that. And usually they are. Usually they are. 
Right. That wasn't the case with this one. They had a very, uh, uh, the pretty strong structure there that I, I just kind of followed the spine of that and, 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 and then hopefully deepened it and widened it along the way. Well, I, I really appreciate it. I mean, I haven't seen Mark Spector. Like, I, I've watched cartoons, but I wouldn't say I've seen every single cartoon, obviously. And I right. to me, this was like my first time seeing Mark Spector, Moon Knight, in an animated form, at least to me. I mean, there may be a version that exists, but it was so great seeing him, one, on screen, but also seeing a version that I found myself strangely identifying with because I felt his emotions were very real. I feel like a lot of people in that situation might go, hey, I lost somebody so I lost the will to live and fight. And yeah. and that's very real. And, and, and so to have a character go through that and then see through the eyes of someone younger and then also someone older than him uh, still have this hope in them, he kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, like you said, it sparks that change in him. And I thought the arc was great. And I thought would you, not only did you capture that really well, you and the whole team and everyone who made this episode, you guys did really great on that, but also the, the overwhelming odds in this episode you know, I, be- I believe in Peter Parker. I-, I believe he will get out of any situation, but I'll be honest with you. Even watching this episode, I'm like, I know this is only episode three of a six-episode season, but what are they going to get out of this? Like, they- everything was really stacking up against Peter at the end, and luckily, right. luckily because of that change in others, uh, Peter did have a fighting chance. So outside of Peter Parker, um, you know, and you mentioned Aunt May and, and Mar- you know, Mark Spector a little bit, but were there other characters in this episode that maybe you haven't written before or you have written before that you just really enjoyed and that you maybe hope to get your hands on again one day. Yeah, you know, uh, most of the other characters are new to me. Yeah. Uh, that were in the, They're not characters that I even really am familiar with, even in the comics. So they were all new to me, and that's always a challenge because uh, you're kind of uh, stumbling around in the dark. And, you know, I've had situations on other animated shows where they're creating a whole new bunch of characters and, and the show's not on yet. And you have to write these characters, and they haven't even had a voice recorder for them yet. And you're 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 guessing these characters at least were established characters. Um, but I have to say, I just want to go back to Aunt May if I can, because she was so pivotal to the story, and she's one of my favorite favorite uh, Spider-Man characters. I mean, love Aunt May. And one of the journeys we go on as a writer is sometimes as a character you don't give them a second thought, and when you start to write them, something magical happens, and you click. And when I was writing the Spider-Man comics. Aunt May, who was a character I almost sort of in my mind dismissed as like an old cliche joke on some level, I started to write her, and I understood her in this really deep way, and I fell in love with that character, said the man who killed her off in the comics. (laughs) Um, But I really, really did, and and so uh, she's a really, she can appear to be, especially the, the classic version of Aunt May, can appear to be... Uh, a cliche and, and 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 not very deep at all. But when you really peel that character psyche back, she's a very deep, interesting, and profoundly strong woman. And one of the nice things about this episode was you really see Aunt May's strength. You really see her strength. Now, this is obviously a different Aunt May than than the older, uh, uh, more sickly Aunt May that we know from the from the comics. Um, this, this, this Aunt May is a little bit more akin to the movie Aunt May sure. um, but it's still it's the same thing to see that strength in her uh, is, is a really a fundamental quality to that character that people often miss I, I couldn't agree more and like you said I'm, I mean that's how I feel about the character and I think once I got older and I saw the struggles um, that my mom went through like for example like 10 years ago I had a I, I was in a hospital again for a different type uh-huh. of head injury I had a brain aneurysm rupture and Yikes. you know and seeing my mom through that again I don't remember a lot of stuff I felt at the time but I always remember what my, my mom was going through and once I started realizing that and I started getting back into comics like you know, nine years ago and stuff I it made me understand characters like Aunt May a lot more and how much they they worry and how much they they responsibilities on them and how much they take on themselves sometimes unnecessarily so and it it, it was awesome and then hearing you you know speak of her like that is great because I do think a lot of people just dismiss her and go ah oh, she's just the aunt uh, you know we don't have to do anything with her uh, except maybe write one scene where she says something wise and it's like no there's there's more than that to that character and, and I'm glad you approached it and I thought you del- you guys delivered that really well in this episode yeah yeah, she's a character that's been through so much struggle and tragedy and pain, yeah. and yet always comes back to meet life head on, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and doesn't really does it, you know, that's where Peter gets a lot of it. Right. You know, Uncle Ben, you know, certainly was a huge influence, but if you think about it, I never, really never thought about it until we're talking about it right now. 
so much of what Spider-Man is and does in a very different form is who Aunt May is. Yes. You can't, she don't, you don't keep her down. You can throw all the tragedy at her that you want, whether it's, you know, the loss of her husband or their financial troubles or her health troubles or whatever it is. She will get knocked down and she will get back up. And that's the essence of who Peter is as well. Exactly. Uh, they're the comeback kids. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to have insights about these characters <laughs> after all these years. And I never <laughs> thought about that until this moment. Hey, that's great. Well, that that means a lot to me that we could we could have that on this show and have it a conversation between us, uh, you know, 30 years after I learned out who you were. Um, and so, you know, obviously, you know, I... I I can't thank you enough for your time. You know, you come in here, what it meant to me, and, and not only that, but all the stuff you've done. I know it, I, it sounds, you know, like I'm I'm just here to kiss your butt, but it, it, there is just an admiration that I have for you. I mean, everything earlier you mentioned your, your Grateful Dead Go to Heaven review and how you said after that, you know, there was this line I saw, and like you said in an interview, where you'd rather, you'd rather not review than give something that negative and... Uh, and you yeah, yeah. and and that actually has stuck with me ever since I read that uh, for the first time years ago, and I do that now. Like on this show, I'm I'm very positive. I do get critical, but I too have seen that reaction from people, and I said I'm going to take a page from JM's book, and I am going to just you know be very respectful to the audience, and I open anytime uh, you know people. Luckily, I you know it's not like radio or print anymore. I can do this show, and now if someone really disagrees with me and they're like a fan of the show, I ask them to come on the show, and we can talk it out. And that's something that's that a, great. You know, that's great. And that's something a lot of people couldn't do before. And and because we have that technology now, I oh, I'm open to conversation. And I love hearing other people's perspectives. Helps me grow as a person and a reviewer. And it helps you know me get more connected with my audience. So uh, that all comes from you. And so I just want to say thanks for. Oh well, thank you. you well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> that's <laughs> great. And you know, it's it's the joy of it is that it's all just opinion. And that that was the lesson I had to learn too as a reviewer. It's sure. like I am a very opinionated person. If we were sitting down alone and not in a public forum talking about movies or books or whatever I'm incredibly opinionated sure. but I also know that my opinion is just one point of view and that's the fun right you know the fun is that this is how I feel about this how do you feel about this and discussing that and throwing that back and forth and I think sometimes when we're younger we're a little bit more um, maybe entrenched and in, in, in the belief that our opinions uh, somehow are more uh, uh, in concrete somehow you know and then you learn that it's no, it's just my point of view, and it's fun and to discuss and dissect. And you can be critical and still be respectful as well. Yeah, I always tell people it's the it's the lowest stakes possible. Like, if I disagree with you on a, a comic book story or a movie, like no one is hurt, so we can totally have an open right, conversation. Right. Yeah, but it's like no, nobody should be upset by that. It's uh, it it should invite conversation more than anything. Um, yeah. So that's, that's that is. That's um, so again, thank you for being here. I want to mention everyone again. Please, if you're out there going to, you know, now that comic shops are slowly opening up again, or if you order online, if your shops aren't open, please check out Impossible Inc. from IDW, Moon Shadow from Dark Horse, uh, The Girl in the Bay from Burger Books. You know, if you're home renting movies or buying movies, get Superman Red Sun, uh, the upcoming Deathstroke Knights and Dragons, and JMS. Where can people find you on Twitter as well? Um. Just at JMD Mateus on Twitter and same thing on Facebook and uh, my website, jmdmateus.com. Awesome. And I'll Any of those will work. And I really, really enjoy the interactions uh, with the people that read and appreciate my work. And so, uh, uh, I, you know, like I said, we spend a lot of time alone in rooms with our imaginary friends. So it's nice to connect with the people <laughs> that are actually out there reading this stuff and watching this stuff. Awesome. And I'll put a link to all that stuff down below, guys, so you can check out his amazing body of work and you can connect with him yourself. And uh, and JM, again, this has just meant the world to me. And I, I look forward to the, the upcoming work you have and everything you're going to be doing in the future. And everyone out there, please go watch Maximum Venom, Episode 3, Vengeance of Venom. Uh, my review of it will be going up this week, but I, want, I wanted to wait a couple more days so that way you guys can have more time to watch it because that'll be a full spoiler episode. But make sure you go watch it and enjoy that show very much like I did. And JM, thanks again for being here, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. You're all right. And we'll see you next time. Everyone else watching the show, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Let your comments be known down below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. See you in the future. Peace.